All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the Azapo Limpopo online series of political education. Um, today we are going to be looking at um, the application of provinces and what <coughs> the Black Consciousness Movement um, recommends in terms of what we do for our country. Uh, this is not a new topic of discussion. It is something that uh, the Black Consciousness Movement has uh, spoken about and carried for the last 50 years. Um, I am today hosting Brad Don, Don Gadden, uh, who is, who requires no introduction uh, to the Black Consciousness Family and uh, Liberation Movement. Uh, as he is a stalwart of the Black Consciousness Movement, uh, born at uh, Middleburg in 1948. He did his uh, metric education at uh, Butsabia Law Training Institute, obtaining um, a B Juris and LLB degrees at the University of Limpopo. Um, he got admitted as an attorney in 1977 and uh, married and settled at Teflo. He is... Um, a leader of note in the Black Consciousness Movement, having led uh, the uh, organization at different levels, from being a branch chairperson in Mamkweng, provincial chairperson at Limpopo, uh, deputy secretary general at the national level, secretary for manpower utilization, publicity director, and uh, secretary general. Uh, there are so many things that he has done for the liberation state, his contribution over. A, a lifetime of his contribution. He's been a founder member and uh, past chairperson of the Black Lawyers Association. He is a... He has done a lot for the liberation movement. Um, sorry, he is a founder member and past president of the convocation of the University of Limpopo founder member of the Worldwide uh, Zionist Front based in Libya. He's also a senior lecturer at the University of Limpopo School, a attorney and a member of the South African Law Commission a Special Project on Security Legislation and also a legal advisor to the Lutheran Church. Um, you know, over the lifetime of his uh, contribution to our struggle, he has um, <coughs> Azapo, he has defended Azanla, ANC, MK, PAC, and applicators in the apartheid courts, as well as thousands of university and high school learners in the wake of the 1976 uh, uprisings. And uh, during uh, the period of the transition from the apartheid uh, era to the democracy that we now have, he is the one who wrote the letter that withdrew Azapo's participation from the Codesa negotiations. Um, he is well traveled, uh, having traveled to a number of uh, countries promoting the black consciousness and trying to reconcile the liberation movement ahead of those um, uh, Codesa negotiations that were held at Kempton Park, having been to Libya, to Botswana, to Lesotho, to Zambia, Zimbabwe, USA, Britain, Germany, Holland, Switzerland, and Norway as well as Belgium, so many countries that um, he has been visiting, uh, you know, fundraising for the Black Consciousness Movement, as well as talking to other uh, liberation movements. Uh, welcome, Bradon. And, uh, Thank you. I wish to spend uh, the next uh, hour and a bit um, to you and really in conversation about um, you know, the struggle of our land and the things that we have seen happening. Uh, just by way of um, uh, introduction, I just want to play this as we welcome you to this conversation. Uh, take a Oh, <laughs> 
I am hosting Bradon, as we affectionately call him. And today we're going to be engaging in conversation about uh, the structure of our country. And we have about nine provincial governments, as well as um, a national government. And Azapo, over its um, 50 years of existence as a revolutionary movement, has actively engaged in struggle against uh, the re rejection of the balkanization of our country. And um, we have seen this uh, division of our country taking different forms at different times. You would recall that uh, the colonial powers, uh, you know, came and descended upon our country to be <coughs> peace of our country over time. Um, you know, they came from various uh, European countries like Portugal, Britain, Netherlands, Germany, and France, and all over Europe trying to, you know, plunder the mineral resources of our country and ultimately colonizing it. And uh, in the process, balkanizing it and partitioning it into colonies, uh, we had the Cape, the Natal, the Free State, Orange Free State, and the Transvaal. And then in the march of time, as we transitioned into this democracy, we still have our country balkanized into three, or what is it, nine provincial governments. So I'd like to tease Bradon a little bit about the, the genesis of this balkanization of our country. Where does it emanate from? Um, and just to check whether the liberation movement as, as, as we knew it um, was not on the need to destroy the balkanization of country and establish a unitary Azani. Pradon, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, well, it's very difficult to start, but let me start with a disclaimer. I, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not occupying any official position in Azabo, so my views um, will not be the views of the organization. <laughs> 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 I, went, I don't want to take it. Look, I'm talking to the stalwart of the Black Consciousness Movement who has been there, seen that, and actually developed some of the policy positions in the movement. So yeah. I am quite conversant with many policy positions of this yeah. issue, um, in its entire. So I just want your perspective uh, today about, you know, the the journey that we have traveled thus far and up to you know the position mm -hmm. that we have taken and it's important that our people get to understand you know the genesis uh, you know mm -hmm. the, uh, that brought us to where we are today so so your views mm -hmm. are your views well <clears throat> maybe let's let's our let's understand the history when mm -hmm. when the ANC and PSC were banned in 1960 uh, the white regime then started promoting Bantustan, mm. Bantustan leaders. And Azapo was the only uh, political organization in the country, the, well, the a genuine liberation movement in the country at the time. And we fought the Bantustan. Um, uh, then I think mid 70s, Let's, let's move to mid 80s. Mid 80s, um, the regime realized that it was now unable to rule the country because of the black resistance. 
at the time and started negotiations with the exiled ANC. And uh, some of the black <coughs> liberation organizations only joined the negotiations later when they were formalized. Now, I want to talk about the Pakistans and the provinces because um, everybody is aware that there is a, a similarity between the former Pakistans and, and the provinces, and people must understand how it came about that. Mm. Um, we we have almost as many provinces as there were Bantustans at the time. Mm. Um, it, it started with the ne negotiations that were held um, at Captain Park. Um, before the actual talks started, there were what were, co were referred to as talks about talks. In other words, the liberation movement, we came together with PSC and ANC and formed the Patriotic Front. The in initial intention was that we are going to have talks between the white regime and the liberation organization. Yes. But then, um, as the momentum developed, um, the intention was, in the end, to hold a round table discussion where the Pakistan leaders, the regime, and the liberation movement would be equal partners in the negotiations. And mm. that is when the Azapo started picking up problems with our patriotic uh, partners. Because we thought the Pakistans and their leaders had a choice to join either the, the regime or to join the liberation organization. But we, we couldn't just envisage a stage where the liberation movement would have an equal vote with Pakistan leaders. Yeah. And to us, to us this was a, was, a, was a principal position. Mm. This, this then led to the, um, to Azapo being uh, kicked out of the Patriotic Front mm. just before they the, 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 the negotiations and then we we then realized that um, we had no role to play in the Codesa uh, negotiations because they were not likely to produce anything that black people would be proud of. You can imagine the setup at the time was that um, <clears throat> the regime hosted the talks in the, within the country. We wanted yes the talks to be held outside the country and, and presided over by a neutral chairperson. But the overwhelming opinion uh, was that the talks must be held inside the country. Yes. And when we looked at the composition of the participants, um, the regime um, paid for the venues, for transport, for accommodation, for food, they even um, paid stipends to but, uh, participants. And we realized um, uh, the position of the liberation movement was so compromised that we didn't, didn't expect any good results from Captain Park. Um, the other thing was, of course, that the liberation armies were uh, demobilized and um, uh, disarmed. There was no way, if the talks broke out at the time, there was no way the struggle would be revived as it was at the time because mm. uh, it would be difficult for the liberation movement to uh, go outside again, and re resume the armed struggle. It was not mm. possible. So we realized um, the compromises that the liberation movement was called upon to make were just too great. And yes. the, the, the last row was that the issue of land, the reposition of land, and the redistribution of the economy were not on the agenda of the discussions of the liberation. That's why even now, it, it's, it's only now after 26 years that we hear talks about amending section 25 of the constitution that talks about the right to land. Because those issues not, were not on the agenda on the agenda of Congress. Mm. And, and that's the reason why Azapo thought 
I think um, we we would withdraw from the negotiations because it looks like the white regime um, was looking for uh, black leaders in order to uh, to front them politically. Mm. Uh, mm. It was not it was not a attempt to transfer power to black people. And and when you look at the results of the campaign, Park, I mean. Look at the consequences. These consequences we are living through today are the direct result of the negotiations that were held at Kempton Park. I mean, the outcome was that blacks were given the government, the, the political power. The political power and the whites retained economic power, they retained uh, the land. And we, we were then expected to run a country with about 50 or so million people, a developing country, with taxes only. In other words, um, I think today the taxman collects about a trillion per annum. I mean, how do you run, how do you develop a country of 60 million people with mm. only one trillion dollar, uh, a trillion rand for that? Like you can't do that. Mm. So it was quite clear that the plan at the beginning, and even now, is that um, you will. Real, I, I, I usually give this um, analogy of if you have three dogs and you want them to fight over a bull, you don't give them three three bulls. You give them one bull. Mm. They, they will fight and and even forget about the bull. Now what happens here is. Whites are sitting on trillions of, 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 of rand. I mean, in this country, there is a lot of money in private hands, white hands, that's not being invested in the economy of the country because they don't like um, the debate around the redistribution of land. They are actually, their excuse is um, there is political uncertainty about the property rights, and therefore they are ready to, they are not ready to invest their yeah. trillions. And as a result, the economy is going down. I mean, if you, if you look at the last 26 years, I mean, unemployment has reached the high. In fact, I think we are the highest in the world by, by the unemployment in this country. We are the, we are number one in terms of Inequalities. You are the most unequal society in the world. In the world. Mm. In the world, yes. And um, uh, our lives have regressed so much that, I mean, even violence, for example, just femicide. Femicide were number one in the world. Mm. Mm. Um, corruption, I don't know where we are, but I think we are right at the top in terms of corruption. Mm. Mm. Now, all these values have been eroded because of the the Codesa Captain Park uh, negotiations. We compromised just too much. I mean, mm -hmm. we are still cramped in 13% of the land, and we, uh, we, we consist of what? More than 80% of the population. Uh, look at our homeless people 7,000 people, black people living in, in, in shacks today. Mm -hmm. um, I, I always, when I want to be generous to the ANC, I'm saying their leaders have realized that they simply can't develop the country uh, with the little that they have from yeah. uh, tech and infrastructure. They just help themselves to what is there. You know? um, I'm not trying to justify it. That is very, very bad. I mean, mm -hmm. but, but, the, the government cannot resolve the crisis that the country is facing. I mean, um, one, if you can't give people land, you are not going to resolve their, their economic situation. I mean, some of us wanted to build malls. Where am I going to build a mall if I don't have land? Mm -hmm. So all malls are owned by white people, mm -hmm. farms, um, all banks, agricultural land, um, you name it, it's, it's in white hands. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and 
you, 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 you are told we have attained democracy. Uh, it's, they, they will never talk about freedom because what we have is actually not freedom at all. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not freedom at all. I, I think the, the other thing which I think is the, the, the um, bone of what I'm trying to say today is why do you have um, nine provinces in a country like ours? I've always asked people in the street, why do we need Masuku in Johannesburg as a NSNMC for health when kids can do everything? Yeah. Every, every department, national department is, is multiplied nine, mm. nine times. And as a result, we, 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 we are one of the most overgoverned nation on earth. You, you have 400 MPs, what do you have? 200 uh, members of the National Council of Provinces. You have thousands of MPLs. We have thousands of councillors. Mm. You, you add on traditional leaders. Then, you know, uh, politicians constitute almost half the population. Mm. And that's why today, polit polit politics and politicians dominate our lives. If you are not a politician, nobody listens. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, mm -hmm. mm. now I hear you. you and, and I, you know, I really want to, to understand this thing. Uh, we went into those contests and negotiations in the early 90s. And uh, we got what we call the, the, you know, a democratic state or the, you know, democracy. Democracy. And, yeah, and, and we have what they call political power. Do, do, you, do you really think that this country has attained uh, political power? Because, you know, when you have political power, it enables you to effect, you know, the, the development changes uh, that you need to effect in the country for, for progression and, and, and forward movement, and so that people can see the real change. And, and I think, you know, in as much as, you know, other components of the liberation movement would tell you that we have, uh, you know, democracy, we have uh, really freed the country. I think no component of the liberation movement can claim to have really advanced the country in terms of the objectives of the liberation project. And, and, and here we are with, with a balkanized um, uh, country and all we need was to expand the Bantu stance because if you check the form and the nature of the provincial governments that we have and, and the general governance is, is no different <coughs> to what the liberation movement was fighting against uh, during the period of uh, you know, serious uh, liberation uh, struggle. Can we really claim to have you know, a country led by people who have political power? Yeah, no, it's not possible. I mean, political power must be buttressed by economic power. I mean, you, you can't have political programs which are not supported by the economy. I mean, it, it, it remains a dream. I mean, the, the ANC has been dreaming in the last 26 years to improve the lives of people. They can't do it because they don't own the economy. Yeah. Um, I mean, look, 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 look at the social grants today. I mean, do you, can you really be proud of a nation of 50, 60 million, um, 15 million of whom are on welfare? I mean, yeah, yeah, what, yeah. Of state is, what type of state is that? They can't create job because they, they, they don't have the land. They don't have the economy, they don't own the economy. And all they are living off our politicians are salaries mm. from, from, from those who own the economy, um, the taxes of those who own the economy. There, there's just no way you can have any uh, meaningful political program if you can't have uh, economic muscle to support it. They, mm. they, will, they, will, they will always be promises and promises and promises until such time that <clears throat> economic power is spent. Mm. In, in about when, uh, three years ago, 2017, uh, you know, the African National Congress, you know, you know, started to have a conversation within itself about 
the reconfiguration of these uh, provincial governments. And uh, I think uh, as we march towards the 2019 election, uh, you know, that reconfiguration discussion uh, got more heated and, and there were some proposals that, um, you know, maybe the ANC is now beginning to listen to the view that has been propounded by the Black Consciousness Movement over time, that uh, we need to, you know, do something about these provincial governments and the problem is uh, that of reconfiguring them to, you know, from nine to six or some other model that, that they are looking at. Do you, do you really think that is something that we should be looking forward to? Well, I, I think, look, <clears throat> my understanding, even at the time, just before 1994, was that certain of the agreements that were reached at Kempton Park would apply only in the first five years. And after that, there would be major changes. For example, um, this, the, we have always proposed that you can retain the nine provinces, it doesn't matter, as long as they are not political entities. I mean, you can't have nine premiers and uh, nine legislatures uh, this, they are just the same as you know, Bandu stands, we call them tin pot um, uh, uh, leaders, dispos, because they, they actually don't have uh, uh, political power. You, can you, can anyone really tell me in the last 26 years uh, what legislation of any significance was passed by the provincial legislature that you still uh, mm -hmm. remember? You can't remember. Now, what, what, what legislation? I, I looked this morning at, at um, Schedule 4 and Schedule 5 of the Constitution that gives the provincial legislators power to make laws. I mean, they make laws on very silly things like dog checks, <laughs> license, like that. I mean, you don't need them. Mm -hmm. So, and, and when, when you look at the cost, I mean, an, an MEC is a politician entitled to. Um, bodyguards, housing, insurance, traveling. Mm. Uh, when, when, and, and, and when you just calculate the cost of one MEC, mm. who, who actually has a national counterpart? Um, the provinces, there is no law, a provincial law that can be uh, nullified by this national government. In other words, there is no area, legislative area, where provincial legislatures have absolute power or final power. Mm -hmm. They can be overruled at any time. And why do we keep them as, 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 as political entities? We can remove all the politicians and, and, and also remove the, the National Council of Provinces. Né? We can save billions and billions of money. The, 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 the provincial seats right now can be used as service centers, for example. Mm -hmm. We have administrators that carry out programs of the national government. We have the municipalities. I mean, why do you need three tiers of parliament if two can make it? I mean, the national government and the, and the municipalities can, can effectively serve the population. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe, and this is personally, it's not as I, I believe the, the provinces were created in order to provide employment to cadres of the liberation movement when they came back unskilled, mm -hmm. right? And I think I will be... I will be uh, 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 and so they have accumulated enough pension funds to... <laughs> now... I really can't see, for the sake of me, and, and I, I've told all premiers in this country, I, they've been personal friends of mine. I just ask them what role they played in, 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 my, in, in my life as politicians. They yeah. couldn't define themselves mm -hmm. because there's just absolutely nothing, you know? Mm -hmm. when, when Jesus speaks on COVID, he's the last word. I mean, MACs can tell us when to go and do tests and stuff like that. But you need a politician to do that. 
I mean, mm. they can send us doctors to come and test us. Why, why should, should I have a Minister of Economic Development if I have um, a, a, a National Minister who does everything? Mm. Now, I don't know. And, and I think um, the, the, the bad thing about politics also is perpetuating the, uh, the tribal element in our society. I think the, there was a time when I argued that once you, if you outlaw racism, you must also outlaw tribalism because we have been fighting both of these things. Why? Look, it, it's, it's no brainer. If, if you are in Limpopo, in Limpopo here, uh, the, the premier will come either from the Sutus or from the vendors or from the Sangan. In KwaZulu Natal, it will be Zikalala. In the Zulu, uh, Eastern Cape, it will be Koza. You've got to be a Musutu to be a premier in the, in the Free State and a Motswana to be a premier in, in, in Northwest. I mean, what type of country are we building here yeah, when we actually try to fight racism and tribalism? Zuma is at times called 100% Zulu boy. I mean, what type yeah, of nonsense? Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and, so, and yet we call ourselves a developmental state and you wonder, okay, yeah. to what end are we developing this state? Yeah. Uh, if we continue to balkanize a country you know, along yeah. tribal lines. And I think you know, our struggle has, has, has regressed and, and the country has regressed so much. And, and the question that uh, people are asking is, okay, this is where we are now, 26 years uh, beyond 1994, what should we be doing differently? We have had, for instance, the you know, uh, government and, and some within uh, you know, the state apparatus talking about the reinforcement of um, district uh, municipalities as, as some kind of models of governance. Uh, shouldn't that be the, the real focus of, of governance in the country? Because I mean, that is where, you know, governance should be closer to the people and, and to those services that are required by the people. Um, and, and how do you then begin to justify the continuance of you know, provincial governance and you know, all of that? How, how do you do that? I mean, look, it's still going to be get it's still going to get more complicated with the constitutional court. Mm. It's a judgment that um, you can you can become a you can become a politician. And you know, all right as an individual, but mm. belonging to a party, it's going to, be, mm. going to be more complex. Now, you can imagine then um, the the ANC is already talking about holding one election for all these three types of government. I I can't imagine the confusion that's going to mm. to, to happen at the time. I I hope. The provinces will be gone, and because uh, really, I, 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 for the sake of me, I, I, I still, I'm, I am awaiting a convincing argument why provinces should continue mm. uh, to exist when they, they reign the fiscal so much. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a time I think two years ago when I threw up the costs of provinces to the national fiscal it was unbelievable and and, and in return uh, there was nothing that people of this country are getting from from provinces in fact they are just another uh, source of, of corruption just another side of corruption. I, I i really can't see how anybody can stand up on political platform and justify the existence of provinces and the mm -hmm. money that mm -hmm. is poured into. None, none of these provinces are self-sufficient. They all get money from the central government. Um, maybe Gauteng, I don't know how much, maybe Gauteng uh, uh, can, can sustain itself, but all other provinces are waiting for the Minister of Finance every year to allocate um, funds for them. And then how much of that goes to politicians? 
more than half of it goes to politi politicians' uh, pockets. But for mm -hmm. politicians don't don't create wealth. I mean, they, they all they do is spend and spend and spend. I mean, instead of we uh, using this money to divert to train uh, engineers, doctors, accountants, economists, and stuff like that, the money goes into the pockets of politicians. Yeah. Who, yeah. Who, who does not? Who, who don't uh, create wealth and who don't create jobs? Sure. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is uh, I am here in conversation with Brad Don Gadiman. Uh, you know, he is uh, conversing with us about uh, the structure of our political governance and looking at uh, you know the, their efficacy and what we really need to going forward as a country. Um, you know, one of the uh, people observing on Facebook, uh, guys, if you have any questions, you are more than welcome to ask but don't any uh, uh, questions on Facebook as well as on, on Zoom. Uh, I will take, um, you know, uh, don't those questions. And one of the issues that uh, people are mentioning is the issue of, of, of corruption um, in our country. And, um, and, and you've mentioned, uh, you, you know, that you know, a lot of billions are, are being um, charged uh, you know, through corruption. Do you, do you really think that the ANC as in government will be able to rid itself of corruption? And, um, you know, <coughs> now that the, you know, the spokesperson of the president, um, you know, it, you know, her family is kind of involved in some COVID-19 corruption activities or possible corruption activities. Is it really possible that, uh, you know, the, the, this kind of can rid itself of corruption? And, you know, we have heard uh, recently the Minister of Finance, for instance, talking about, um, you know, going to the market to source additional funds, you know, to support our country. Uh, don't we think that, you know, that money, if it does come from MF and other, you know, funders, will just go into the corruption kitty instead of, you know, helping to resurrect the country out of the quagmire that we are finding ourselves? Look, um, I don't think um, corruption in government can be wished away. I don't think it's going to happen anyway. Um, I will tell you if, what I would do if I were Cyril Ramaphosa. Mm -hmm. Immediately, I got information that the husband of my spokesperson uh, has been uh, awarded a tender of 125 million yeah. out of COVID-19 funds. I would have immediately uh, stepped in mm -hmm. and, and fired my spokesperson. <clears throat> because, you know, at least compared to his predecessor, Ramaphosa had some, some form of human face, you know. And we, we actually thought, well, a person who brings his own billions is not going to uh, promote theft of taxpayers' money. But right under his nose, um, a tender is awarded to the husband of his spokesperson. Uh, it, is, it is just sickening. I mean, he would have just stepped in and said, look, uh, people, I didn't know this was happening, but now that I know these are corrective steps that I'm taking, I'm not going to allow that to happen because it tarnishes the image of my office. Mm. But, but I've been waiting for uh, the president to say something. I don't know if he said it and I missed it, but <laughs> I haven't heard say, say anything about it. But if it happens at the presidential palace, at the union buildings, huh? I don't know if they will have the capacity, let alone the will, to, to mm. stop it. Do, do you realize oh, well. that uh, uh, President Ramaphosa has teeth to bite? I mean, uh, considering the fact that, uh, you know, she, he is where he is through some uh, funding from uh, Georgia people that we don't know, 
a billion rand was spent to get him to where he is, uh, you know, uh, within his party. Yeah. So, so yeah. we don't know how much more uh, has been pumped into sustaining his, uh, his position where he is as, as president of the country. Uh, but I mean, uh, if a, an individual within a party spends a billion rand just to secure uh, leadership of the party, yes. that speaks volumes. It, that speaks. it does. It does. I mean, it is unbelievable. You can imagine what uh, the country can do with a billion. I mean, look, I, I, I know Ramaphosa um, from those days in the 70s when he was a student at Textbook. And um, he was a nice young person. And I, I'm prepared at all times to give him the benefit of the doubt. At one stage, I, when I was Secretary General of Azabu, and he was Secretary General of the ANC, we actually met at the Twilly House and talked about negotiations. And, mm -hmm. and I, it, we, we just met as Secretary General to explain why Azabu was not part of the negotiations. Uh, I think he is operating from the belly of a monster. There is just no way he's going to be effective alone. There are so few people in the cabinet, for example, that are not um, having corruption clowns over them. Um, you talk from Aposa, maybe uh, Sisulu, and a few others, right? Um, you need only listen to the late uh, Mlange mm. uh, decrying, decrying the, the rot in the ANC to understand um, that it has gone very, very far. Now, I don't think Ramaphosa has the power um, to end corruption within his own party. Um, we, we, we have looked at various options that he might have. I don't think we can come up with anything that will be effective. The ANC has reached a point of no return in corruption. In other words, the only um, way in which the population can get rid of corruption will be to vote the ANC out of power. <laughs> and, and this is my, my personal view. It's not even a political view. It's just my personal yeah. view. Mm -hmm. based on my own practical experience of the, the 50 years I've been involved in, pol in politics in this country. Mm -hmm. Look, I mean, the people have to vote um, a different uh, political power. Are there any signs that, um, you know, the, these are the options that are available for people to, to vote for uh, in the country? I mean, if you look at um, the voting patterns in the country over time, you know, there's always been along, you know, the traditional, you know, political liberation movement and, you know, the, you know, the traditionally liberal uh, parties uh, of all the people. And there hasn't been any, anyone raising his hand uh, strongly saying, look, I, I am the alternative. What, what do we really need to do as a people to provide <coughs> with a very good alternative? You know, um, the thing that complicates political coalitions is political leaders thinking that politics should be a career. Mm. Um, in a developing country, I think our politics should be developmental. We should be able to work together even where we don't agree on us. Now, people may just be afraid that if the ANC loses power, there will be confusion in the country because no single opposition power or opposition party at present appears to be a viable alternative. And they're right, they're right. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it's just that I'm no longer an active politician, but my, my gut feeling would be Opposition parties, especially black opposition parties, should come together and um, formulate a strategy in terms of which the general population 
is confident that if the ANC goes, there is an alternative government that will restore mm. law and order and will be corrupt. No. Um, I, I can't really say. You see, the, the, the biggest opposition party is the DA at present. But the DA is traditionally a white party. And white people or historically have oppressed black people. Mm. Uh, a, a majority of black people will not vote for a white party in this country. Not now, not tomorrow. Mm. So the, the DA <coughs> has reached a, a glass ceiling. It's no mm. way it can run beyond what support the support that they have at present, right? Um, the, the the future therefore is in 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 coalition politics. Um, and until such time that a viable alternative is formed by a coalition of opposition political parties, parties um, people are going to be very, very anxious. They would like to get the rid of the ANC, but they will be very anxious um, um, about what would happen in this, what would take its place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think uh, no one wants to go back to, um, you know, where we come from. But is it the yeah. um, uh, development is, is um, you know, young people are <clears throat> now looking at, you know, parties like the DA as, you know, political parties and nothing more. Uh, they are not connected at all to the liberation struggle. And if you talk, you know, liberation struggle to them, um, it means nothing because they were, no, they were never they were never they were not born. Uh, but yes. but you know, juxtapose that against the you know the developing phenomenon of you know the what they call themselves as woke, uh, you know, young people who see themselves as conscientized and wanting to. You know, position themselves as change agents uh, in, in, in the development of this country. What are your views on on, on, on these developments? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> look, uh, political ideas must 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 also change at the the pace of life. You know. Mm -hmm. um, um, the the problem maybe that some of us still have is to think of ourselves as um, uh, conventional liberators. But I think uh, the the born freeze, as I call them, um, <clears throat> have the right to their own lives. They must they must be able. Uh, I mean, with the change in technology today, um, the, our politics must also adjust to the changes. And uh, um, I believe the, the youth, the youth must be heard because um, the times are gone when parents would dictate to the children what lives, what professions they must follow, what life, what type of life they must live and stuff like that. It is their own lives. They must, they, must, they must have more and more say in the affairs of the country. I, I would support the move by young people to take their rightful place in mm -hmm. the politics of the country. I would, I would be a supporter of that. Yeah, yeah. And, and earlier on, you, you know, in part, you just made mention of the, uh, you know, the judgment of the constitution around uh, you know, participation uh, in, in elections. And I'm really, I mean, you, you're a seasoned um, uh, legal in this country, and it would be interesting what your views are um, with regards to judgment, uh, you know, that basically says, well, we will open up. And if Azabu was to come to you and say, well, can you advise us on what perspective, um, you know, can we... Uh, get out of out of this judgment, and how do you move forward? What would be your advice? Yeah, <clears throat> look, I'm look. I'm now thinking as a lawyer, not not as a. As a <laughs> I like <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. I if I were a constitutional court judge, uh -huh. and I was I was about to make this historic announcement, 
that people can represent others without going through a political party. I would have sought opinion, for example, from the IEC. I would have sought opinion from other political practitioners to say, I am of the view that this constitution um, must provide for people to go into parliament with, through other means. Now, tell me how practical this is going to be. I, you know, judges cannot just uh, uh, follow the theory of law because it's correct to interpret the constitution. The constitution is a, is a piece of legislation. It's, it's, it's just about less than 30 years old. Mm. It has gaps, many, many gaps. Now, if you, we, we leave it to individual, well, not really individual, but if we leave it to the constitutional court judges to uh, fill up the gaps, we're going to land into serious problems because the judge does not say uh, when an individual wants to represent a constituent in parliament other than through a political party. This should happen. They should have, the, the judge, the, the constitutional court should have gone beyond the interpretation of the law to say, I, we think as the court that our judgment um, is practical in the following respects. Yeah. Now, you can imagine what, what, what problems we have now with that question. And, then, and it's a final judgment. You know, the question court cannot just go back and reverse it. Yeah. And the IEC, it's, 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 it's um, and, you know, it's at six and seven. They don't know what's going to happen because the electoral act has to change. And the whole mm. structure of conducting elections in this country is going to, to change drastically. And they are very faithful. And the next elections are there in how many years? In, in two years, maybe. In two years or so. Mm. Yeah. So I, I would imagine that judges should be very, very careful when they introduce. They, they, there are certain laws of this country that are, that are against the question granted. And the, it is the duty of the constitutional court to make sure that all the laws comply with the constitution granted. Mm. But where the judgments themselves create problems, the constitutional court should have the, the decency and the and, and, and authority to say, uh, um, Parliament can pass this type of legislation that can be implemented in this, this particular way. But, mm -hmm. but just to say, go and, 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 and adopt a law that will <clears throat> um, practicalize my decision, <laughs> I, I don't think it's fair. It's not fair <laughs> at all to, to Parliament, to the IEC. Mm. And, it, and now it's there and it's got to be implemented and um, yeah, it's got to be implemented. Mm. And, and it's going to complicate matters when it comes to you know the provincial governments and how do you implement okay. this decision because at the end of the day you have to consider you know the presence of constituencies and you know if you look at uh, local government, for instance, it's, it's a hybrid arrangement where, you know, certain mm -hmm. can yes. contest as individuals for their own consequences. Yes. I, I yes. think how that will be practical and implementable with the, mm -hmm. with the provincial governments that we have. And I think, I think it just makes sense, you know, the argument yes. for that. Uh, maybe to uncomplicate the situation, uh, you know, these provincial governments. Um, the, the, the government to, could... Yes, the government could um, could enact legislation that would um, make it possible um, by introducing a constituency-based election, but um, that won't work in favor of the ruling party. Constituency-based, it, it, it actually implies accountability. Mm. If an, yeah, if an MP is is linked to a constituent, the constituent has the right to a call, not the party. Mm. Now, it, it is it is it advantages the ruling party now 
that power rests with the party, not with the constituents. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I don't yeah. think they will go that way, but it would be a solution to the mm. constitutional court problem. Yeah. Mm. So are we, are we likely to see, um, you know, um, a situation where the country is asked to vote for its uh, president directly, you know, as part of the package of changes that um, uh, may have been introduced, you know, uh, due to this uh, judgment? Well, I don't know if the president parliament, you see the president parliament is the, the, uh, the terrain for the ruling party. I don't see it. Um, bringing about that type of legislation because it does its own complications. If, mm. for example, the, the electorate were to elect a president from a party other than the ruling party or somebody who doesn't belong to a political party, it can create a lot of instability in the country. Mm. Um, you know our country is, is, is not one of the most stable in the, in the, in the world. It can bring a lot of problems. Um, mm. I don't think parliament will be ready to do that, to have the president elected directly by the people. Mm. It is too, too risky. Too yeah. risky. Yeah. Look, I mean, uh, Pradhan, it's been 26 years uh, you know, of um, ANC governance. Uh, um, what should we look forward to in the next 24 years uh, when you know, the country says, well, 50 years of democracy, how should that be looking like as, as we put uh, this discussion? You know, we, 20 years, 20, almost 30 years ago, mm. when, when the negotiations started, um, and we withdrew from the negotiations. We predicted that um, <coughs> this, there will be a second revolution within a lifetime. Mm. Yeah? And, and um, the signs are all there, look. We, I don't think there is any other country in the world that has as many protests as we have. I mean, there is no single day in this country where there's no protest of one shape or another. In other words, the, the population is very restless. Yeah. Now, unless uh, politicians, because they have the, the power now, um, change course drastically, I don't think we will see the next 26 years. I think there's going to be another revolution and, and and i don't want to say it because nobody wishes that to happen yeah yeah but i think there's going, there's going to be a, another revolution because mm. the the first one was not uh, properly contributed so the first uh, one was aborted yeah uh, yeah and 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 so in essence um we should uh, prepare ourselves for a revolution against a liberation yeah. organization yes and then mm -hmm. it's a revolution that um, the politicians won't be able to handle it because it will essentially be a revolution against them. Mm. And, right. um, well, we are going to have very little. I think um, the government must force those who occupy land at present and those who own the economy to bring those two issues on the table for a very, very serious discussion. Mm. Because, uh, or create conditions in the country that will force those who own the economy and the land to, um, to, to bring them on to the for discussion. Because um, it is only when the owners of the land are under, um, pressure that they mm. will they will they will agree to the fair distribution of the land. Otherwise they won't do it. I mean yes. Codessa gave them gave them a briefing space. They gave us political power and retained the two, the land and the mm. economy. And uh, 
Then there was a period of lull in 26 years. There was no major struggle against um, the, those that, that, that own the means of production. But that is coming. That is coming. And, and my, my advice would be that um, those who own the economy and own the land must come together and realize that they can't own those things forever. Mm. Uh, because our new generation is going to embark on the revolution and will take it back. Right? Mm. It would be best if the, uh, another Codesa, if I want to misuse the term, be held on land and econ on the economy mm. as soon as possible. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, you know, not so long ago, there was a you know, talk that there may be a need for another, as you put it, Quadessa, to look at, you know, um, the land and, and the economy. And you seem to be agreeing with those people that it may be necessary uh, that we, we get into another uh, discussion. And I'm not too sure um, how likely are we to agree on the need, or, you know, to agree with those people um, that, uh, or how likely those people are to agree with the oppressed that they need to transfer land, transfer the economy to, to, you know, to the oppressed people. Because uh, it's, in, it's not in the nature of people who are holding power to transfer power willy-nilly. No, it is not. And they are not going to do it. But they will do it under pressure. I mean, yeah. we, if it, it wasn't for black people, black people's pressure in the <laughs> 70s and 80s, we wouldn't even have got this political power. Mm. Now, it, 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 it depends on the citizens of this country. If they are satisfied to live under the sectors, the, or under the present circumstances, fine. But they can't then complain. Yeah. Because there's just no way um, you can forever have less than 10% of the population occupying 87% of the land. You can't have that situation. It can't exist anywhere. Mm -hmm. it, it can be sustained anywhere on this planet. Now, we, we know that at one point it's going to end. And how it is going to end and when it's going to end will depend on the citizens of this country. And yeah. if they make conditions uh, so difficult for those who control those things, they might just um, agree to a discussion. Yeah. And, yeah. And maybe for another compromise. But mm. it, can, it can't be that um, a small population in our, in our motherland would own 90% of the economy and 87% and of the land um, forever and ever. Yeah. It's not going to happen. It's not mm. going to happen. Now, unless the, the present government tries to address that, it will be too late and they may not preside over the transfer of land and economy when the time comes. Yeah. Adon, let's, let's, let's conclude this discussion. Um, <clears throat> it's been uh, over an hour of, of conversation, but I want us to do it. And as we do so, um, I'm really interested in your view of what will activate, you know, those who are oppressed into struggle. <laughs> Come again, rephrase that. No, no, no. What I'm saying is, um, you know, there's, there's a bit of complacency now. And, and every time mm -hmm. into a, an election, you know, people are, are hoping that things will change. Uh, what will really activate people to, 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 to engage in that revolution that you are talking about? Because you are envisaging a second uh, revolution coming. And yeah. You see, Mm -hmm. Largely due to the, the, you know, the pressure that is needed uh, for the transfer of, of power, economic power, the land, what would really be the tipping point that tips the, the scales to such a point where people, you know, you know decide that this is enough? Um, mm -hmm. let's, let's engage in that revolution as, as we conclude this discussion. Okay, I, I think... Um, the present government, the, the social grants that they give to, this, to, to, to our unemployed and, 
destitute people. These are going to dry up. You know, they, you can't, you can't give people grants without the hope of replacing um, the money with something. The, um, the government has now decided that everybody in the country must have some kind of income coming in. If you are not working, then you must be on old age pension, disability pension, child grant, or just J um, 350 rand per month. Mm. Now, not sustainable. That, 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 all <laughs> that is going to dry up. I mean, it's unsustainable. There's just no way you can just spend and spend and spend, and nothing comes into the kitty. Mm. Now, mm. when they are going, when they tell people at the time when the funds dry, dry up that you are no longer going to get your 350, you are no longer going to get this and that and that and that. That's the beginning of a revolution. Now, you, you have seen last month with the taxes. The taxes just said, you know, government, we, you, you can't just stop us from making income for our families. Mm -hmm. Arrest us. The government chicken dog. You can't do that. You mm -hmm. can't do that. Um, now, that is just a tiny portion of civil society yeah. um, that successfully defied the government. Now, mm -hmm. can you imagine if the government is going to be defied by the unemployed, by the destitute, by the homeless, by then, then you have a revolution of proportions um, that have never been experienced anywhere in the world. We, we, we are really sitting on a product. But yes. our politicians don't seem to realize that. They go about and making some more promises. How do you explain the president's, president still forming committees to fight corruption now? <laughs> By now, we would have expected at least half of the culprits in, in prison. In prison, exactly. But, yeah, but, but the president only last week says, yes, I, I uh, see CIU, call it that? <laughs> uh, SIU, I proclaim you have powers to do one, two, three, and you can go and recover money stolen. Money stolen is never kept in the pockets of the thieves. Exactly. They will, ne they will never find that money. Mm. So, I, I really don't know. I, I just think the, the government is not doing enough. Why they are not doing enough to change course, the, the, the lives of our people? I, I have no idea. Mm. I don't think they really care. Yeah. Every politician thinks he's a, he's a career politician. Mm. Mm. That's, yeah. Yeah. So in essence, uh, Bradon is saying the president was correct in saying uh, on our own. And uh, we need to take responsibility for our lives, for our land, for our economy, and uh, for the development of our state. Uh, so we can't really trust that the state will, will do it for us. So, so let's do it for um, I, I, I wish to thank you, Bradon, for spending you know, the time in, in conversation. Yes. It's been a very lovely discussion. Yes. Well, it was a very entertaining, uh, made and talk. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope it's not the last. <laughs> no, no, it can't be the last. It can't be the last. Um, I'm sure we will invite you again, uh, you know, for, for yeah. conversations. And in the coming yeah. weeks, uh, there are a number of, um, you know, areas that we want to explore with a number of our stalwarts. Um, I, I look forward to the discussion that we'll be having in the next uh, week or so on, you know, the education crisis, for instance. Education crisis. Which, uh, which is yeah on, ongoing and continuing, and uh, the other things that we want to talk about is uh, you know the experiences around uh, the lockdown and, and the coronavirus. So it's, it's going to be very interesting conversations coming up in the next couple of weeks. So I, I look forward to continue to you know engage with you. Um, the, let's connect again. Uh, next uh, Sunday, uh, same time, same place. And uh, thank you very much, and thank you for connecting. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Yeah.
Thank you very much. You have been very generous yourself. <laughs> Next time. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Cheers, everybody. Okay. Have a good, okay. yeah. Have a lovely yeah. uh, afternoon. Keep, keep your mask on. Yes. 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 Please uh, make sure you you continue to mask. <laughs> Have a good one. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. And.